So we come to the very last part of the Apocalypse and therefore the very last words of the Lord Jesus Christ that he was permitted to send to the ecclesial world down through history. And we find in this section, in verse 7, and then from verse 12 onwards, the Lord Jesus Christ speaks directly to John because he says in verse 7, I come quickly. In verse 12, I come quickly. Verse 13, I am Alpha and Omega. In verse 16, I, Jesus. In verse 18, for I testify to every man. And so we have the Lord Jesus Christ taking the pen out of the hand of John, who had been writing as he had been told. And the Lord Jesus Christ now speaks directly to John and through him to the Ecclesias, the final words that he wants us to hear. In chapter 22, we've already noted that the first six verses really belong to verses 9 to 27 of the previous chapter. We now have, in verse 7 to 21, the, the final appeal of the Lord Jesus Christ to us. In verse 7 to 10, the, the angel signs out with John. He relates to John and he signs out of the process. And this is the angel of chapter 1, verse 1 now. Not so much the sixth angel anymore, but this is the, the angel that's been revealing all of these things to John as it went along. In verse 11 to 12, the angel tells us that, particularly in verse 11, we are told that Christ's return will be sudden, and when Christ comes, that's the end of opportunity to change anything. Verse 13 to 15, we have the blessings on those that keep the commandments. Verse 16 and 17, an invitation to drink the water of life. And then in verse 18 to 21, a final warning against adding or to taking away from the completed Bible. And that's, of course, something which Christ ends up his whole revelation to man with that warning. OK, well, let's just look at this, what this section is all about. And I want to quote to you, Brother H.A. Twelves. I can't make a better summary than this myself. And this is Brother Twelves writing in the Christadelphian magazine, 1951. The Lord, through his angel, has spent the greater part of the book outlining the course of history from that day, AD 96, to the final judgments of God. The last vial has been poured out. Babylon has been judged. The millennial and post-millennial states have been described. And these are the important words. He is not now in the last chapter going back to give us further signs and times and tell us how long delayed his coming will be. He is doing something much more important than that. He's warning us about the speed with which the last end will come upon us and will leave us as it finds us. And we often talk about the end of the day of opportunity, but that's the message of these last verses. When the angel comes to take us away to meet Christ, it will be too late to change anything. No amount of regrets or tears or promises at that point will mean anything at all because we've had the day of opportunity. And the Lord is saying, when it comes, it will come with speed and it will come suddenly. The word quickly in verse 7, 12 and 20 should be translated suddenly. Not a matter of the Lord coming with speed. It's a matter of coming suddenly and unexpectedly to us. So we have seen a wonderful section of the book of Revelation, but we now come to where the Lord is saying the last things that he can say to us before God closes the revelations of the Spirit. Now, we've already seen in Revelation 22 the, the tremendous rounding off of Genesis to Revelation. But there are more things here in Revelation 22. There's the tree of life. There's the Alpha and the Omega. There's the gates into the city. And I want to just, again, just emphasize how much the Bible rounds itself off the result of man's sin was that dominion was lost. Now we have inheriting all things. So all things that were lost, the dominion that was lost, we now inherit all things. Mortality came by sin. Immortality is now being granted. There was shame and exile from the Garden of Eden. They shall see his face, closeness with Christ and with God. Creation was cursed, and now there's no more curse. Thorns and thistles grew. A forest of the life of trees. Sorrow, crying and pain came because of sin. No sorrow, crying and pain at the end of the millennium. Evil reigned. No evil is allowed. 
enmity and hatred, peace and harmony. And it's just incredible how much things will be made new by the process of the kingdom of God. And we can't get away from the fact that the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is telling the same story. What was lost is going to be regained. It's a beautiful little parable of how God's purpose is working out. Well, in verse 8 to 10, I'm just going to leave verse 7 for the moment because, you know, as the sixth angel wound up his revelation to John about the bride city, the Lord just interrupted at that point and added, probably a voice came and just said, behold, I come quickly. Again, just assuring us that all of those things will surely come to pass. But then in verse 8 to 10, we have this interaction between John and the angel. And I believe this is the angel of chapter 1, verse 1, Christ's personal angel. And having seen all these things, John is just totally overwhelmed. He's like Daniel at the end of chapter 11. You know, Daniel's just, his brain's just a fog. And the angel says, no, don't worry. We'll just talk about the time of the end. Um, and, and John's overwhelmed. He's just, what he's, he's seen and he's understood from this is just mind-blowing. He says, I, I heard these things and I'd seen all these things. I collapsed to the ground to worship the angel that showed me these things. This angel knows everything about the future. And the angel picks him up and says, John, don't do that. I'm your fellow servant. You know, it's lovely how the angels see us, isn't it? They don't think they're anything different to us. They are brethren. We're all part of the same family. They're doing their very best to get us into the kingdom. They don't have any sense of pride or, or, or being above anybody. They are servants, ministers, as we will be. I'm your fellow servant and of the prophets. And again, how much the angels must have loved those prophets. And of them that keep the sayings of this book. If you want the angels to work in your life, you keep the sayings of this book. Because that's what the angels want to do. They love people who keep the sayings of this book. Worship God. And then he says to John in verse 10, seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book. That's interesting, isn't it? Because when you get to Daniel, Daniel was told to seal up the book until the time of the end. And the prophecies of Daniel were not very much completely understood until Brother Thomas found the truth and then matched the historical records that Daniel was talking about alongside the doctrines of the truth. And the book of Daniel was unsealed, and he wrote a book called The Book Unsealed. Daniel's words were not fully appreciated until the latter days, and that's why they were sealed up for so many centuries. But he says to John, you're not going to seal this one up. From AD 96 onwards, true believers must understand this book. They must have it accessible. They must understand it. They must work it out. Don't seal it up because the time's at hand. And every generation could work out where they were in history. And you knew what was, was yet to come. You could work it out. The time is at hand. And at that point, probably at the end of verse 11, the angel concludes his work with John. And, and Christ takes over directly. Again in verse 12, behold, I come quickly. From here on, it's Christ speaking and not the angel. So we come to verse 11, which is quite confusing to some people. But before we do, I just want to say about humility. You know, what a difference between humility of the angels compared to the Pope. You know, when new priests are ordained and they go to the Vatican to get their certificate, whatever they get, they have to get on their face and gradually crawl to the Pope to be accepted into the priesthood. What did this angel do? This is an immortal angel, Christ's personal angel. He said to John, don't worship me. You know, what a contrast that is. Just a little note, the difference between true religion and false religion. And so we have in Revelation 22, three times the warning from Christ in verse 7, where I think probably added to the end of the sixth angel. And then again in verse 12, Christ takes the pen and finishes the book, except for John's concluding comments. Behold, I come quickly or suddenly, not with necessarily with speed, but at a time when you're not particularly alert. You know, we read a lot in the Bible, don't we, about the suddenness that will come to the world. They'll come as a thief in the night to the world. It shouldn't come as a thief to us. But I believe, brethren and sisters and young people, that the coming of Christ will not be in the middle 
of a war in Ukraine, it'll come at a time and we think that life's just getting on like normal. And that's the warning. I'm going to come suddenly. And we have to be prepared any time for the coming of Christ. There's not one thing that has to be fulfilled. We know that. There's not one prophecy that must happen before the Lord could come for us. And so time is short for us. Now, there are three warnings in this chapter. The first is an exhortation. It's just attached to it is, you're happy or blessed if you keep the sayings, the prophecy of this book. So there's the formula. That's how we attach ourselves to Christ. We keep the sayings of this book. In verse 12, it comes as a promise. Behold, I come suddenly and my reward is with me. I'll give every man as his work shall be. So it's a promise that he's coming to reward his faithful servants with immortal life. And then in verse 20, the very, very last thing that Jesus ever says, he adds a different word. Surely, surely I come suddenly. It's a guarantee. These things are true and sure. But it's a threefold warning in these last words to be ready and watching. And you can't miss the power of that, brethren and sisters and young people. It is a threefold warning not to be caught unprepared. We know in chapter 16, verse 15, lest any man walk naked and they see his shame. It's not a time to be caught unprepared. We've got to keep going with our spiritual life. Okay, then we come to verse 11. And it's quite an unusual verse because it sounds like the angel is saying to John, well, look, if you're unjust, just stay being unjust. That's okay. Well, it's not saying that at all. What it's saying is the verses are not saying don't repent, don't change. What these verses are saying is that when Christ comes, all chances to change or improve are finished. It's no good when the angel comes to take us away to meet Christ to say, look, just give me another week. You know, I'll pray three times a day. I'll, I'll do everything. I'll, I'll read. I'll I'll go to the meetings. I haven't been going for a while, but I will go. No, it's too late. If you're unjust, if you're not spiritually with God, too late to say, look, I'll, I'll get it right. Give me another couple of weeks. Too late. And that's the point of it. And everybody will now see who the, the unjust and the filthy really are. Today it's very confused. Our world tells us that all these people with their you know, practicing these evil morals that they have are just as good as anybody else. Who are you to criticize them? Even the Pope says, who am I to criticize them? And that's the spirit of the age. Nobody, you can't call anybody unjust or filthy in their morals. But when Christ comes, even in the ecclesia, whatever people are, is fixed and final. That's what he's saying. If you're righteous, you're righteous still. If you're holy, you're holy still. If you're unjust and filthy, that's the end of it. Can't change it at this point. And our woke age has really got it confused about who the righteous and the filthy are. You know, we're regarded as the bigots. We're regarded as the people that, that are screwed up, that, you know, that, that need the crutch of religion. And they glorify these people that are living immoral lives. When Christ comes, that division will be very clear. And then in verse 13 onwards, Jesus describes himself to us. This is how he wants us to remember him. Of all the titles of the Lord Jesus Christ that go through the Bible, and there are many, many of them, he says, this is the one I want you to always remember. I am the Alpha and the Omega, beginning and the end. Now, in the Greek alphabet, Alpha and Omega are the, are the, are the two ends, like A to Z, we would say in our alphabet. So it's the total package. It's the start and the finish. And what Jesus is trying to impress is that even before creation, before God set about ordering this world, he had a clear plan in mind that there would be a son that would be the pivot of salvation, that there would be a lamb slain from the foundation of the world that would be the salvation of all mankind. So he was right there in the beginning in the mind of God. It was the word, the purpose, the plan of God to have a saviour that would be his only beloved son. And he's there at the end when he hands back the kingdom to the father. I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. 
tremendous thought, isn't it? Jesus, that's how I want you to see that this is not, you know, I wasn't plan B. It wasn't God sat down and said, oh, dear, Adam and Eve ate the tree. What am I going to do now? It wasn't like that. God always knew that man would go down that path. There always had to be. It's when you build a house, you dig a hole first. And so with the creation. There had to be a downfall that God could build it up to a grand edifice, edifice again. So Jesus said, I want to think of me as the Alpha and the Omega. That's how I want you to think of me. I'm, I'm, it's always been God's plan that I'm here. And then he gives a blessing in verse 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments. Now, in verse 7, you keep the sayings of the book. But it's got to be practical. You've got to do his commandments. And you have a right to the tree of life. You can actually become immortal now. And you go through the gates. And we read about the gates, didn't we, in chapter 21? You know, the gates of Pearl, the hope of Israel, through the work of the apostles. We go through those gates into the city that he's just described for us. Then in verse 15, he makes the point that a lot of people are going to miss out. When the time comes to go to the tree of life, there's going to be others that are sent away. And he describes them as dogs. That's one of the words that Paul used of the circumcision party. Sorcerers, whoremongers, murderers, idolaters, whoever lives and makes a lie. None of those will go into the city. None of those will get to the tree of life. They will be without, cast out into outer darkness, into the fire prepared for the devil and his angels. A terrible warning, again, given by the Lord Jesus Christ. But notice the word sorceress, the pharmakia, the, the people who drug others into insensibility. Pharmakia, whoremongers, murderers, idolaters. But again, notice at the end of verse 15, who maketh a lie. You know, this, this aspect of lying is something that goes right through these last chapters and how much God hates it. And then Jesus says in verse 16, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify these things in the ecclesias. So it's definitely Jesus speaking now directly. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and the morning star. Well, look at this again, how much it brings in the promises. He's already taken us back to the tree of life and the promise made to Adam and Eve. Now he gives us the promise made unto David. I am the root and the offspring of David. In other words, I was before David. The kingdom of David was a tree that came up, was cut down. And out of that stump of Jesse came another shoot, a regrowth of the king of Israel. I am the root and the offspring of David. And so the promise to David is brought in there. And then you've got stars. Well, that brings us to Abraham, doesn't it? I am the bright and the morning star. And the righteous shall shine as stars in the kingdom of heaven. So shall I see be, God said to Abraham, talking about the stars, but there's one brightest star of all. It's the morning star, the one that shines above all others. And Jesus says, I am the bright and the morning star among many stars that will reflect my light. You know, these are incredible how the three promises come back here in Revelation 22. But notice in verse 15, this thing about God hating liars. You know, in these, these verses, the contrast between the tree of life and the, the ones who are liars is just so dramatic. The faithful have a right to a mortal nature. In verse 15, the poisoners, the pharmacia, the immoral, the idolaters, and the liars. And when you go through this section, in chapter 21, verse 8, just flick back there. You know, one of the things at the very end of the kingdom, it says that in the final destruction will go all liars. It's just amazing how that happens. Then you come to, to um, chapter 21, verse 27, at the end of the, the first part of that vision. Anything that defileth um, or maketh a lie. And we get to chapter 22. And again, anything that loveth or maketh a lie. And we get this constant repetition that there's this hatred of lies that deceive people and take away their knowledge of the truth. And there's a great emphasis right through this record about God getting rid 
of lying because it was the lie of the serpent that brought sin into the world. You shall not surely die. He was wrong. But liars take two forms. They take reduces or they add. You can add to a truth by adding extra things in, or you can take away from what God has said. And so both of them are condemned by God as lies. Now, why does God hate lies so much? Well, I love these verses in Jeremiah 23. Jeremiah broke his heart over the false prophets. My heart is broken because of the false prophets. I go out and say the words of God, and they jump up and say, no, 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 it's not like that at all. You know, the Hananiah, the guy comes, the false prophet comes along and says, those that are going to Babylon will come back in two years. And Jeremiah is saying, no, they'll be there for 70 years. And the people believe Hananiah. You know, Jeremiah breaks his heart over the false prophets that keep, keep doing it. He goes to God and says, oh, I don't want this job anymore. God says this to Jeremiah, behold, I'm against the prophets that says, says Yahweh that steal my words, everyone from his neighbor. And that's what it does when we take away from the, the sharpness of the word of God. When we say, well, God doesn't really mean or God doesn't expect, you're taking away, you're stealing the words of God from people's mouths. Behold, I'm against the prophets, says Yahweh, that use their tongues and say, oh, God says. Behold, I'm against the prophets that qualify false dreams. Oh, God's spoken to me. And do tell them. And they cause my people to err by their lies and by their lightness. Oh, you know, no, no, look. God, God doesn't expect that. That's just too harsh. We can't do that. God says, I hate those people. I hate those who steal my words from the mouths of people. You know, Ephesus was commended because they had tried false apostles and found them to be liars, deceivers. And we've got to be prepared to do that. When false doctrine bobs up, even inside the brotherhood, we have to be prepared to take it on and say that's not what God said. Because God hates lies, because they take away people's salvation. Look what it goes on to say. I want to come down to look at verse 18 and 19, because it continues this theme of lying. The fate of the adders, I don't mean snakes, but they are snakes, but the fate of those who add to the word of God. I testify to every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add to these things, God will take away, add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. You can find some pretty awful plagues described in the Bible. Just read Zechariah 14 about people melting on the spot and the, their eye sockets melting away. Think about the everlasting fire that Jesus talks about. Anyone who adds to the book and says, I've had a revelation from God. I've got new information. I'm, I'm adding to the Bible because God's now talking to me. I'm a prophet. Not many Christadelphians claim that. But you go to the Catholics. The Pope speaks ex cathedra. He's the voice of God when he speaks from St. Peter's chair. His words are the words of God, say the Catholics. The JWs have their 12 apostles, their governing body, and they get direct revelation from God so they can write it in the Watchtower magazine. The Mormons have Joseph Smith and golden plates. The Pentecostals say, God told me to do this. God told me you have to donate thousands of dollars so I can buy a jet plane. And they do that. Google it up. You'll see it. God wants me to have a jet, a personal jet. You see, they're adding to the word of God. They're adding to what God has said. And there are some Christadelphians who claim that they have the guidance of the spirit which is not what we have today. So they're adding to the words of God. And they say to you, as one person said to me, when I was having an argument over a doctrinal matter, this person said, the trouble with you, Ron, is you're a, you're a chapter and verse person. I don't need that anymore. The Bible tells me what to believe. And no, no, the Spirit tells me what to believe, she said. The Spirit tells me what to believe. I don't need that anymore. I don't need chapter and verse. I'm in the Spirit which is no longer in the truth. So the fate of the adders, people who add are going to get the plagues in this book because God hates people who steal his words away from their neighbours. So does it matter? Well, it does matter. They won't be in the holy city. 
They won't get the blessings written in this book. But then we have the reducers, and this is the more scary one. If any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, and I think it's not just the apocalypse. I think it's now the completed Bible. If anyone takes away from the words of this prophecy, God shall take away his part and, look, and notice this. Out of the book of life, out of the holy city, and from all the blessings written in this book. You see, these people who are being warned are in the book of life. They are in the holy city. They are part of the way of salvation. And these are Christadelphians who say God doesn't mean what he says or that you don't need to study prophecy. It's all too complicated. The Bible isn't fully inspired. And then you have to make a choice which verses you'll accept and which you don't accept. Who say that we have to re-evaluate scripture because science is right about evolution. And therefore they tell you that, well, Exodus 30 verse 11 is actually a scribal insertion. It shouldn't be there because it's embarrassing to their views on evolution. And just like evolution's gone down this path, they end up with who knows what part of the Bible is inspired anymore. And they're stealing God's word from people. And the same's going to happen with morals. People are going to say, well, why should we condemn homosexuals? If there's love, who are we to condemn it? They take away from the words of God. And that's the warning to Christadelphians. The people being warned here are in the book of life. And the last thing that Jesus ever says to the Ecclesias, do not write down the sharpness of God's word because it suits your society, because it suits the pressure on evolution. Don't ever give up on the clarity of God's word. If you do, you're throwing away your part in the book of life and your part in the holy city. You know, that's apart from surely I come suddenly is virtually the last thing that Jesus says, because he knows in the last days that's going to be our challenge. It's going to be Christadelphian saying it does not matter. We have to go along and, and stay on line with the world. We have to accept the world's values, which are against Bible values. That's going to be the pressure. You're going to get it in the workplace in big doses, and it will come into the ecclesia. That's why we already have Christadelphian gay websites, because this pressure will come, and they'll take away from the word of God. And that's the warning we have. I want to finish on a positive note. You know, Jesus said, I have sent these things to testify unto the ecclesias. This was his last opportunity to speak to us. The last encouragement we have is found there in verse 17. The spirit, that is the mind of God, the word of God, and the bride, our brethren and sisters, down through the ages, are all talking to us. They say, come. We want you to be part of it. That him that heareth, come. You know, bring in people. Anyone that hears about this should come and join, be part of it. Let him that is a thirst come. And, you know, the thirst for spiritual thinking is something we must have. And we must train our children to have. Lo, everyone that thirsts, come to the waters and drink. If any man thirsts, let, me come, let him come, said Jesus, and drink. Because in the end, when the kingdom opens, the Lamb will take us to living fountains of waters. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness in the Beatitudes. You know, the appeal is to get our heads around these spiritual things. Everyone that thirsts, come to the waters. Drink of the water that I give, and you'll never really thirst in this life. If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Let him that is a thirst come and take of the waters freely. And that's the last encouragement of the Lord Jesus Christ, to keep ourselves in that spiritual frame of mind of divine thinking. And so the apocalypse ends up with Jesus saying, surely I come suddenly. And John adds, 
Even so, come, Lord Jesus. And we can share that sentiment, can't we? The blessing was promised right at the start. Read it. Hear it. And there's a difference. You can just read through it like a bunch of words. But to hear it, you must understand. You must appreciate what God and Christ are trying to say to you. Then you've got to live it. You've got to keep it and protect it and live it out in the things that you do. Because the time is at hand. Well, I want to leave you with some of the words of our beloved brother Thomas. Again, it was Israel. The Lord has revealed what is to come to pass in these latter days. It is both our duty and our privilege to make ourselves acquainted with it, that our faith may grow and be strengthened, that our affections may be detached from the fleeting present and set more firmly on things to come, that our minds might be fortified against error and that we may be prepared to meet the Lord as those who have kept their garments and shall not be put to shame. And that's why we love the study of the apocalypse, brethren and sisters, the Lord's last message to us, full of warnings and full of encouragement to thirst after the things that really matter. Again, I can't put any words better than some of the pioneer brethren. Such is the consummation of the divine purpose in the creation of the heavens and the earth. He formed it to be inhabited, to be a tabernacle for himself with men. He could, had it pleased him, have created it perfect and filled it with immortal inhabitants at the beginning. To have done this would have prevented all the crime and misery that blot and crimson the record of the past. But then the world would have been a characterless auto automaton and unfit for the association with the governor of the universe, whose attributes are moral as well as intellectual and potential. He desired a society for our planet consisting of tried and faithful friends, such as Abraham, who loved him better than his dearest son. Now, that's a beautiful summary, isn't it, of, of how we relate to our God and our Lord Jesus Christ through the words of this glorious book. And we encourage you to grow in understanding. Young people, many of what things I said I know will have just perhaps seemed all too much. But with the apocalypse, you have to start and go over it and go over it and go over it. And as your wider understanding of the Bible increases, so will your appreciation of the depth of this book. You've got to be thirsty to understand. You'll have to work at it over the years if we have years. But whatever time you have, work at increasing your appreciation of the very last words that the Son of God was allowed to give you. Thank you. Thank you.